thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to, to be here. I'd like to thank the uh, Rachel Carson Centre for the opportunity to rediscover what it's like to be a PhD student these past two months. It's been absolutely wonderful. This is the official title of my talk, but probably this is what I'm going to talk about more in terms of the mythic, uh, the ideological, uh, the normative dimensions of our understanding of the economy and economic growth. So I'm going to tell you a story as befits an Irishman and a politician. The story of growth and in particular the idea of growth not just as a, a technical uh, aspect of a modern capitalist, globalised economy, which it is of course, and many of you probably had to suffer uh, basic economics, in which case look away now, because I'm going to scandalise you. Anybody who was trained in orthodox neoclassical economics will have a fit, because I'm going to basically criticise the idea of the common sense. This is what I mean, it's a Gramscian term in terms of economic growth is seen as normal, it's become naturalised and depoliticised. Whether you're on the left or the right or even green parties, all promote some version of economic growth. Uh, and I'm going to try and critically in interrogate that. And indeed, growth is seen as the answer to everything. <clears throat> Climate change, decarbonisation, green growth. Uh, poverty alleviation, uh, inclusive growth. Uh, development, modernity, growth. Growth is the one option we have constantly as the way to grow ourselves out of problems, create more wealth, and maybe if we're lucky we get a bit of trickle down. And that's often how it's justified in terms of a dominant policy. As befits the introduction where I'm going to give you a, a political, the second part of what I'm saying here, my big picture analysis. The first part is really about ideas, debates around economic growth, can we replace them? The second one is more difficult. How can we translate and get popular support, build alliances for alternatives to economic growth? And that's much more difficult and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. A lot of my work is based on criticizing economic growth as essentially based upon consumerism, overconsumption, which is a, a single sentence definition. Consumerism is buying crap we don't need to impress people we don't care about. <laughs> but it is the main driver of the modern economy. Therein lies a major dilemma. So why be critical of growth? I mean, I'm going to give three reasons. One, an audience such as this uh, probably doesn't need much introduction to the idea of sustainability. Uh, going back to earlier limits to growth critiques of the uh, Club of Rome and, you know, uh, Meadows was mentioned earlier in the early 1970s. It's biophysically impossible for a subsystem the human economy, to grow outside the limited confines of the biosphere. So there are sustainability reasons why endless, infinite economic growth is biophysically impossible. I'll also make the claim that economic growth, particularly under capitalism, manages and reproduces inequality rather than actually solves inequality. The third reason is issues of human sustainability or human flourishing in terms of there's a point beyond which orthodox economic growth actually begins to diminish human flourishing. We become more stressed, we become more concerned about status and status competition, we engage in defensive consumption, you know, building bigger fences, hiring security guards, all of which I would call as a diminishment in human flourishing. And this is what Herman Daly, one of the great grandfathers and uh, originators of ecological or green economics, calls uneconomic growth. The threshold point beyond which more orthodox GDP growth actually begins to diminish rather than add to human well-being and flourishing. And of course it goes without saying that we must distinguish between growth as the growth in quantity of goods and services or the value, the economic value, the monetary value of goods and services and qualitative measurements of human development and quality. So why be critical of growth and what are we measuring? So I'm using 
economic growth as GDP measurements of expenditure in the economy. And this is what gets included in GDP. Good German beer, probably health, uh, bikes, education. But this also gets included in GDP. Divorce rates, that's good for lawyers. Terrible for the family or the child, but actually adds to GDP. Environmental cleanup, paradoxically, adds also to GDP. And war is good for business. And sadly, business is not always good. These add to GDP. What's missing from GDP is the largely gendered labour of women in the home. We don't get reports in the newspapers or in the news bulletins about the value of the unpaid work of women in the home, the care work that goes on in the home. Neither do we get the convivial, non-monetized economy of people in a community garden adding value, adding conviviality, solidarity, providing people with food, but without the exchange of money, doesn't count. And our economic system, as it currently constructed, does not count our democracy in terms of the value of that particular measure of GDP. Now, I'm not saying anything particularly new here. Robert Kennedy, a few months before he was assassinated in a commencement address, I forget which university, had this to say, and you can read it there. In terms of what GDP does not measure, in the strength of our families, our communities, uh, it measures the monetized section of economic life and doesn't give us the full picture. If I had more time, I could describe how Simon Kuznets and Robert Solow, some of the great originators of GDP and economic growth theory, they also accepted that economic growth as measured by GDP is not an accurate measure of social welfare, and yet, and yet, it is still the dominant economic objective as a proxy for wel welfare. This is 1968. It gets worse in terms, if you look at orthodox neoclassical economics and its understanding of the economy. So anybody trained in orthodox classical or neoclassical economics, look away now. This is the model you get in any economics book. The circular model of firms and households, of wages and of inputs, goods and services moving in. But the reality is, again, an audience like this knows it's not circular in that simple way. The human economy is embedded in the biosphere in terms of energy inputs, in terms of resources, and in terms of pollution that comes out at the other end. And this is this disembedded view. This is, in a way, a green version of Karl Polanyi's idea of the great transformation, the disembedding of a, of a market economy that's regulated only by, by prices. So this is the ecological ignorance of neoclassical orthodox economics. So it's not really circular in the way that the model describes. And it's not always monetized. Much of the value of the uh, value that goes on in our economy is parasitical, not just on the uncosted, unvalued, externalized natural resources, but also on the often gendered labor of women in the home. And again, this is not particularly new. I mean, it's echoes of the 1960s and 70s feminist movement of wages for housework as a way to get housework on the agenda politically. So the non-monetized section of what happens in our economy does not get recognized. It's the reason, and again, I don't have time to go into too much detail, why most politicians, most economic policy, what do they talk about? Formally paid employment, as opposed to work. Work I'm using as all productive activity, whether it's monetized or not. But our obsession with economic growth and this common sense view of increases in GDP largely and solely focuses on formally paid employment. And the problem here is that what gets measured gets done. So if the unpaid value of the work that women do or communities in a convivial economy do doesn't get included in GDP, it's not valued. So there's a hierarchical relationship set up between the types of activity human beings do, and it's gendered. And finally, and this is again in uh, uh, the ignorance, if you like, of orthodox economics, it doesn't really pay much attention to the inequality that this production system creates 
And here I'd say that inequality matters. Inequality is not the same as poverty or marginalization. These are terms that in the last 20, 30 years have become much more popular as ways of talking about the inequality in our society. Inequality is seen as too provocative. So we talk about poverty. We talk about including the marginalised. But I think we have to start talking about inequality again, particularly to go back to a point I made earlier. Economic growth manages and reproduces inequality rather than fundamentally addressing them. And so, why? Despite all of these criticisms, is undifferentiated GDP, so it's not differentiating between a divorce or an environmental cleanup and somebody producing a bicycle. They all count as GDP. That's what I mean by undifferentiated. We're not distinguishing between the good and the bad in terms of the social impacts of economic activity. So why does this idea still dominate? Not just our political elites, but the common sense view. If growth is not achieved in the economy, in a capitalist economy it's about 3% a year. If we don't have 3% a year, we get into problems. And that's why imagining an economy beyond economic growth is seen as the act of a lunatic, an idealist, or a revolutionary. Now, I make at least two of those. I won't, I won't tell you which two. You can make up your own mind. And I would say, going back to this idea of a narrative or myth or a common sense view of economic growth, to question growth is a fundamental act of betrayal. You're just not with the program, because if you're not consuming, you're not contributing to formally paid employment, you are a disloyal citizen in a capitalist growing economy. But welcome to the resistance. Going back to 1972, we had limits to growth. Social limits to growth then with Fred Hirsch in 1977. Tim Jackson, who's done much in recent times to raise the issue of can we have prosperity, development, non-monetized understandings of human flourishing beyond growth. And then some other ones you may not be familiar with, maybe uh, Richard Heinberg or the Post Carbon Institute, the end of growth. And more recently, uh, a think tank that I'm involved in in Britain called the Greenhouse Think Tank has produced a post-growth project. So there's always been this heterodox tradition, but it is marginalized within uh, the economics profession. And the problem is simply this, I want to use an analogy. There's no negative feedback mechanisms for a capitalist economy. It's got positive feedback mechanisms in terms of capital accumulation, the search for profits, for innovation, for more consumption. And it's got no negative feedback mechanism. It's a bit like a bicycle. It either goes and grows or it collapses and falls over. And this is a big problem in terms of designing or refitting our economy fit for purpose for the challenges and opportunities of the 20th century. Now while I'm critical of this debate about greening growth and green growth, I think it has to be welcomed in terms of being an opportunity to start delinking, unlocking ourselves from this addiction, structural addiction to economic growth. So this is low carbon economic growth. Uh, in Germany and other countries are seen as exemplars of this ecological modernization of the economy. And it's a form of greening, you could say, of business as usual. It enables us to have our cake and eat it. We can still keep on growing and have all our goodies, but without the same inputs or resource implications or indeed pollution. And that's often dependent upon technological innovation, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I welcome this. This is not to be a Luddite or to reject attempts to try and decarbonize our economy. And you find examples of this often in high-level political circles, whether it's the European Union, the Commission, the World Bank. Most states would adopt this particular position of a, of a statement of decarbonization. You know, the German energy uh, transition, you know, moving away from nuclear to, to wind and, and renewable forms of energy would be all part of that debate. And it's also an element that the South, the developing world countries, can actually leapfrog over the 
coal industrial dirty phase of development and move into a renewable decarbonized form of development. There's an interesting one again I don't have time to go into but I just want to mention here is from the ILO, the International Labour Organization, which talks about inclusive and green growth, green and decent jobs. So it does make attention to the issue of equity and the distribution of wealth and income and opportunities in a way that often green growth discourse doesn't. It's simply about the environmental element rather than the social or economic in that you know, view of the three stools of sustainable development. But this is the situation we're at now. I don't know whether people can read this. The earth is riddled with economic growth. But steady state economy, a form of post-growth economics, goes against the religious convictions. So we're not going to prescribe that. Because again, it's so heterodox to prescribe, as I'll describe in a moment, degrowth or moving beyond growth that it's simply not even conceptually possible. You're a lunatic or an idealist or revolutionary. Even though not just a chemist that was mentioned earlier on, most scientists with any knowledge of the laws of thermodynamics and biophysical realities will tell you it's biophysically impossible for a subsystem dependent upon a finite larger subsystem to continually grow. It's like a balloon in a box. At some point it's going to burst. But what really is at the heart of these ideas of green growth and greening growth and ecological modernization is the decoupling idea that we can decouple a growing economy of the circulation and production of goods and services and the consumption of goods and services via technology. So this is the greening of business as usual. And this is the rather happy story that is told that what we're leading into now in the 21st century is a sixth Chondriath wave of innovation. Uh, which is coming after the, uh, the digital I ICT age. I'll just note in passing that innovation has largely been, in my view, corralled into a very narrow technological commercial understanding. And I'll just throw it out there and we can perhaps return to it towards the end or in the Q&A. What about social innovation and new ways of living? Why is it that innovation has been corralled and tramlined into this technological commercial perspective rather than full spectrum innovation, which would include technology but also social forms of new ways of living. So I'm going to give you now three myths, which I think is at the heart and as a way of understanding this common sense, this story of growth. The first is Achilles Lance. Everyone knows about Achilles heel. That was his only weakness, but people don't know about his Achilles lance. This is a spear that could heal the wounds it inflicts. And this is exactly the mindset of economic growth. So you can grow now and clean up later, because you'll have more resources left over. So the dirty phase, the polluting phase of economic growth, don't worry about that, because later on you'll have more resources than you can clean up. And that's sometimes formally expressed in terms of both decoupling, but also the environmental Kuznets curve, that the ecological intensity of production declines over time. And there's some patchy evidence that in some sectors, picking the chemical sector, that actually is the case. But on, on the whole, there's no empirical evidence of a decoupling between the economy and the environment. The second myth is the myth of Prometheus. He was the one who stole the fire from the gods, which is often seen as symbolizing technology in terms of increasing human productive powers, which was only held by, by the gods. But here, I'm just mentioning the issue of climate change and keeping below the two degree limit and its implications for economic growth. So not a radical Green Party you know, Heinrich Bold, Sif Tung, or even myself as an academic, but PricewaterhouseCoopers have pointed out that the, the, the ambition, let's be uh, generous, the ambition of trying to attain the levels of innovation needed. So that's we're going to have to decrease our carbon intensity by 6.2% a year. That's five times more than what we're doing at the moment. I mean, I would say this is science fiction in terms of you know, the ambition and we should be innovating, but to think and plan on the basis of such ambitious, <coughs> fictitious levels of technological innovation, I think is dangerous. 
and also particularly if you look at one of my pet uh, hates is the way in which unproven technologies are now being built into official often government thinking so carbon capture and sequestration is not a proven technology solar radiation management you know climate hacking these are now being seriously not just spoken about and I think we should look at research into them and discuss them but to assume that we will achieve these technologies as a way of greening business as usual is wish fulfillment and not proper risk management strategy Sorry. and there are limits to decoupling so we should be seeking to decouple the economy, production, consumption from energy, pollution, resource intensity. And we have signs of relative decoupling, but there's absolutely no sign of absolute decoupling. Even this economic crash we've experienced since 2008 hasn't really put a major dent in terms of the carbon intensity of the global economy. And often we get on an individual state or nation level a reduction in the carbon intensity or resource intensity not because of innovation but we've outsourced it often to China and there we claim in the countries that are importing these goods that somehow we've achieved a, a decoupling but the one I want to focus on and it's the one that politics and the public is the truth that dare not speak, to, speak its name is to tackle consumption and demand this is what's known as the Jeevans or rebound effect so we increase efficiency of the car, I'll give you an example of the car, but what happens is then we start to drive more. So yes, it's more fuel efficient, but all the savings have been lost because we're now driving more and we have more cars. And here's an example from the EU. The bottom line is fuel consumption has dropped since the 90s, this goes up to 2007. So that's good. So you can get more miles you know, per gallon of gas. But all of that savings, decarbonisation, reduction in pollution, resource use, has been completely wiped out because of increase in demand. This is what's known as the rebound effect. So that is another limit to technological innovation. Because technological innovation, green growth and greening growth are supply side solutions. They only deal with the supply side and not with the demand or the consumption side. And again, to go back to climate change, if we really are serious about decarbonizing and trying to reach the two degree limit, the models tell us that anything between three and four percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions are incompatible with a growing economy. And I'm using here Kevin Anderson's uh, work and he's argued provocatively, and I would tend to agree with him, if we're really serious about climate change, the strongest shoulders of the global economy, the ones who've caused most of the carbon and greenhouse gases that are causing climate change, the overdeveloped, I would call the minority world, must go through a period of planned austerity. Now there's a provocative term, planned austerity. How would that work? try and sell that. Imagine me as a politician knocking on a door looking for votes. Vote for me and vote for planned austerity. Maybe the issue of framing, which I'll come back to now in a moment. Nicholas Stern in his famous report on the economics of climate change noted that it's only been in times of serious crisis. Like the classic ones are the collapse of the Soviet Union and Russian heavy industry. That did lead to a drop in the carbon intensity of Russian industry, but it wasn't planned. And this is not, the, this is not an argument for bringing on crisis like that. Can we plan our decarbonization outside of a crisis? And the last myth of the three is cornucopianism. This is the, the cornucopian cup that kept on giving. This is what economic growth is. And we've become, as a society, used to it. It's our cultural myth we live by. It's sometimes affected and, and translated in different ways, like the classic one is the American dream. Everybody, if they work hard, and the, the future can do better than the past. And there's an assumption in this cornucopian myth, which policymakers and citizens, and particularly neoclassical economics, all buy into, is that the future is going to be much like the present, but with more stuff and better apps. 
It's a very linear view, and I'm particularly mindful of the historians uh, in the room, that we have this very linear enlightenment coming from St. Augustine, if really people want to get into it, this idea of linear development, whereas history tells us that societies can de-develop. You can have circular rather than linear views of human development. And particularly, as I say, there's nobody talking about tackling demand or consumption. Because that is the truth that dare not speak its name. Particularly in the context of an electoral system in liberal democracies, where elections are essentially beauty competitions between different parties promising growth. Or in our context in Europe, limiting austerity maybe. But it's about growth. It's a beauty contest about which party is going to increase growth. So that leads us then, well, is there an alternative? And there are many out there, and the one I'm going to present to you is probably the newest kid on the block, this idea of degrowth. This is its symbol, uh, the slow snail. You know, it's partly related to the idea of the slow food movement and so on, the idea of slowness, of quality and so forth. It's radical. Uh, it's based in the academy and as an activist element, and it always sounds, as most things do, much better in French. Degrowth has a very, uh, it's a very harsh sound, about decroissance. That sounds like something you might have with uh, a coffee and a galois. Sounds wonderful. And Schneider, Callas, and Martinez Ali, this is Juan Martinez Ali, who came up in our discussions yesterday of the Pope's encyclical. He is a prominent member of the degrowth movement. You can see there what it says. It's an equitable downscaling of production that increases human well-being. And I think there's a north-south dimension. It's about, in a way, and I'm thinking of myself, us in the north have to go on a diet, a carbon diet, to enable enough development space for the southern world to rise up and so forth. Because in effect, in terms of a global justice perspective, we in the north have stolen your carbon. So the degrowth perspective is about allowing a space for the developing world to, uh, uh, to grow. So the argument of the degrowthers is that economic growth, certainly yes, it's biophysically impossible, but it's also socially undesirable in terms of particularly the overdeveloped world. And this is really the degrowth position is largely aimed at the developed minority world. It also, if you go back to my argument I said earlier on, if economic growth manages inequality, effectively it says it's like the image of the cake. The economic growth is or the economic growth pie. And what it says is, it doesn't matter the size of your slice, but next year it's going to be bigger. Whereas if your cake is either static or not growing, inequality comes back with a vengeance. And herein lies a problem of social instability. We don't know how to manage, perhaps, the instability that a non-growing economy would entail. Now, it's clear, that's a nice phrase that the degrowthers use, our recession, which in a way is a contracting economy, is not the same as degrowth. That's a, an involuntary, forced, unplanned contraction of the economy. What we're talking about here in degrowth is a planned, democratic, but how do we organize this contracting economy? But at the very least, it does introduce debate and pluralism into economics. I mean, it's amazing to me that when we celebrate in liberal democracies and those of us who live in societies with democracies, we celebrate variety and pluralism in politics. But when it comes to the economy, boom, no, it's economic growth and neoclassical economics. There seems to be a contradiction in terms of our celebration of pluralism and democratic debate. But it does introduce the idea, this degrowth argument, of what's the economy for? That most childlike question. What is the economy for? Surely the economy is a means to an end as opposed to an end in itself. Last time I looked, we lived in societies with economies. Not in economies with a little bit of society on the side. So it's about this Palanian idea of re-embedding, if you like, the economy within the society and both within the larger biosphere. So the issue is how do we figure out an alternative? Now I should say, I support environmental, green growth is better than non-environmental, non-green growth, and certainly pro-poor growth is better than inegalitarian growth. 
So I'm not arguing against growth per se. There are forms of progressive green and indeed socially progressive forms of growth. But I do think we need to move beyond greening business as usual. The challenge here, as Buckminster Fuller says, is what's the alternative we present that people start to gravitate towards that is attractive and not because they're forced to? So how do we present a better, more attractive vision of a non-growing or indeed a contracting economy? That's a big ask. It's a major paradigm shift. I would say it's up there with the transition from feudalism to capitalism or the paradigm shift that happened in the Enlightenment. We're now in a similar phase in terms of what is the new paradigm that we're going to see emerge in the next coming decade and centuries. Now, to go back to what I said already, I mean, to question or criticize growth is an extremely heterodox position academically. You have a lot more conferences on pro-growth models, on neoclassical economics, and certainly you do in heterodox green degrowth or even ecological economics. It's still very much a minority part of the economics profession. And speaking from experience, it is not only difficult politically, it can be electoral suicide. Because we become used to, it's the norm of economic growth. Things are always going to be bigger and better. That's, and, and there's a positive element of that, which I'll talk about in a moment. Even green parties, we promote not degrowth, but things like the Green New Deal, a kind of a green Keynesianism, counter-cyclical uh, argument of government investment and so on. But again, it's always the idea of getting back to growth. I mean, growth in some ways in this current crisis, for those of you who've seen the movie uh, The Wizard of Oz, it's a bit like Dorothy clicking her ruby red slippers. Get us back to 2007. Back to 2007. Back to 2007. All governments bailing out banks, or banksters, if you want a more provocative term. All the policies of austerity are about trying to get us back to what I think is a failed system. But yeah, it's very heterodox to say that when people are hurting, when they're unemployed and so on. And that's the practical element. Academically, it's easier to say this, although often not without its controversy, but politically, it's extremely difficult. And that's some help I'm going to need uh, with at the end. So I think we're locked into carbon and we're locked into growth. And so how do we unlock ourselves from both? I mean, we have most attention in politics and policy on unlocking us from carbon. But I also think we need research around unlocking us from economic growth or suboptimal. It's now uneconomic growth. To put it simply, in the overdeveloped world, our problems are not problems of scarcity of production. They are problems of redistribution. And yet that is a heterodox position to say in a growing economic common sense view. So we're systematically addicted to growth. So I think like any addiction, and I am a doctor, although a useless doctor, as most of colleagues would know, if you're ever on a plane and so, is there a doctor on the plane? <laughs> Have you got existential angst? I can help you with that. No, toothache, no, I'm not. You're not a real doctor then. But pretend I am a real doctor here. So how do we prescribe a medicine? We have to acknowledge there is a systematic problem, and I think we're not even at that stage yet. There are small elements. Uh, and I think, for example, the Stiglitz Fatuzzi uh, Sachs um, Commission looking at, you know, trying to challenge GDP was an indication in the right direction, but of course that's gone nowhere. David Cameron, when he was elected in Britain, under the last coalition government wanted to have non-orthodox economic accounting to include some of these non-monetized elements, but again, it's gone. So you get these elements, you get heterodox economics tradition, but no real movement in terms of moving beyond economic growth. And indeed, it's curious, and it's a phrase that I've heard at least twice since I've been here since May. Why is it easier to think about the end of the world than the end of capitalism? Or indeed, I would say, the end of economic growth. What if, and here's a provocative suggestion, the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world? Again, it's the issue of how do you frame that? Moving from the academic intellectual down to the practical political. And indeed, I think we need to differentiate growth. What type of growth do we want in what sectors? And I'll give some ideas in a moment. And indeed, finding new stories to tell. Because if you accept, I'm not saying you do, but just for a moment, suspend your belief that economic growth is a story, it's our cultural myth. But what are the new myths we want to live by? What are the new stories we want to live by as a society?
And so the Kubler-Ross grieving cycle is often used in these debates. Um, I was first introduced to this when I was doing a lot of work on peak oil, and there's quite a lot of uh, use of this particular psychological mechanism of grief. Now, if, we, if we've got an addiction, this is part of our problem. Are we grieving when we reject economic growth, or even those who reject climate change? Are they threatened by a change and they're grieving for a way of life they may no longer think is possible? And that's why we get this rejection. So, you know, you know, the denial, anger, depression, and so on. And I don't know where we're at on the cycle. I think somewhere between denial and anger in terms of economic growth. And I think this is about a paradigm shift in terms of our thinking about the economy, and that's where green political economy, heterodox economics, ecological economics, and degrowth all of a contribution to make. And one suggestion is, can we begin to imagine and to think of replacing orthodox GDP growth with other alternatives like economic security, which the International Labour Organization actually has done a lot of work on, or Buen Vivir, which I've been introduced to since I've been here. I don't think there's going to be one size fits all in terms of different models of development, not necessarily growth. Growth can contribute to development, but the issue is to determine the point beyond which orthodox monetized GDP growth actually begins to negatively impact human development and flourishing. And this is where I'm interested politically and the types of coalitions that are needed. I now have one comrade in the Vatican, I think, and Pope Francis, if you read his encyclical, and many of us discussed his latest encyclical yesterday, I think there are elements there that the faith communities, at least in the Catholic Church, seem to be moving in this direction. Can we get trade unions behind this? And there is some movement, the International Labour Organization, European Trade Union Congress have begun to talk about, largely in the context of green growth and green, low carbon, sustainable jobs, but it's a start. They haven't yet begun the debate around work and employment. They're still focusing on formally paid workers as opposed to this broader spectrum of work and a broader understanding of the economy. Can we make bigger, not better, sorry, better, not bigger, the motto of a fit for purpose economy in a climate change, carbon constrained world? So the take home message, it's time to consider the heterodox position of moving beyond orthodox GDP, undifferentiated economic growth as a permanent feature of the economy. That's the current system that we're in. We should begin to start framing growth as a means to an end and not an end in itself and move towards the redesigning more fit for purpose economies for the 21st century. So this is not a rejection of economic growth per se, or a rejection of all growth. But we need a precautionary as opposed to a Promethean approach to growth. Even though there are many uncertainties in some of the analysis I've made, I think there's enough for us to move forward in terms of questioning economic growth. And I think there's often a failure of imagination. I have a quote here from Roberto Mangabera Unger. In terms of this failure of imagination, this simply cannot think beyond the current confines. You know, it's easier to get to the end of the world than the end of capitalism idea. So what sort of growth do we want? Growth in libraries, solar panels, or another variety of yogurt or chemical weapons? I'm always curious, there's always money available for war, but not for education. Where do we want to put our productive assets? How do we re-politicize the economy rather than fetishizing it as somehow natural? It's like a force of nature. We even get this expressed in our popular discourse of the economy. The markets have spoken. I mean, that's so resonant with a mythic view that gods have spoken. And austerity as sacrifice to the gods of the market. So again, I'm quite interested, as you can tell, in this mythic, storied element of what's often seen as a very dry, technical issue of economic growth and the economy. How do we move to, from quantity to quality? And how do we, in terms of technological innovation, move from the focus, which is in the green growth and greening growth discourse, which is about increasing the ecological efficiency of production, how do we move towards increasing the ecological efficiency of human flourishing?
When can we see public policy designed not around increasing economic growth, but increasing our democracy, the strength of our communities, convivial, non-monetized economies, recognizing and valuing and supporting the unpaid work of women? These are, and that's quite radical, but we have some of the elements there already. My view is we have all the technologies we need to make the sustainability transition. What we haven't got yet is the political will. So rather than going on about solar radiation management or carbon capture and sequestration, all of which are supply side solutions to green business as usual, how do we begin to asking that politically inconvenient truth of questioning consumption, of regulating democratically demand? And that'll scare to be Jesus out of a lot of people. Oh my God, a green Stalin is standing giving us a talk. <laughs> And there are issues around how do we move towards a more planned, regulated economy in this, which we can get into maybe in the Q&A. And I think, just to begin to finish up, this, uh, this book, which many of you will probably be familiar with, by Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. They have a wonderful, eloquent description that summarizes my position. It's a, it's a journey. Economic growth was needed particularly in the overdeveloped world in Europe, North America, Australasia and Japan. But we've now come to the end of a journey. In a way, more provocatively and less eloquently, that's what cancer is. Cancer is the growth of healthy cells outside the confines of a threshold that's propedeutic and healthy for the organism. Are we now in the stage of cancerous growth? We're continuing growing, but now it's cancerous. It's uneconomic forms of growth. And that's why I'm an unreasonable man. Another famous Irish man. Better beard than me. You read there what he says. The reasonable man adapts himself. It's the unreasonable one that challenges. Therefore, our progress depends upon unreasonableness. I'll give you two examples. This is my contribution to unreasonable thinking, a book I wrote in 2012 with the inelegant, clunky title, The Politics of Actually Existing Unsustainability, and Unreasonable Political Action. So, thank you for listening. I have...